Hello and welcome to the Football Fan Show. Um, I am well aware of our problems, of our issues. Apparently our upload speed is fine. I'm really not sure what the problem is then. Um, so, yeah, we are intermittent. We are pausing every now and again. Apologies. We're still trying to get to the bottom of this. This is, what, our sixth or seventh stream? You'd have thought we'd have sorted it by now. By now, but... Don't know why I turned all, went all Essex there. Tom Moore joins me. Hiya. Guys. What is up? What is up? Hiya. Uh, right, we're live again. And uh, we can chat about all the good things. All the good things indeed. Coming up on tonight's programme. We are talking all things from the Project Big Picture which is now a big failure. We've also got uh, the counter-proposal from Gary Neville's uh, consortium slash group, which is made up of loads of different people, in fact. Uh, David Bernstein, um, Mervyn King, former director, former lead honcho at the Bank of England. Even the Bank of England are... <laughs> Even the former head of uh, the Bank of England is interested in saving English football. Uh, we've got a number of, of people that we're going to get to. Um, we're also talking about pay-per-view television, particularly pay-per-view football. Do you want to watch the Titans of West Brom versus the immovable object of Burnley only on BT Sport Box Office? Oh, no, wait, that one's on Sky Sports Box Office. Buy now for the little price of fourteen ninety five. Do you really want to watch that? Do you really want to pay fourteen ninety five for that? And we're talking about England's captain, or sorry, not England's captain, Manchester United's captain, because the England captain is Harry Kane and he's not crap. But Manchester United's captain, Harry Maguire. Wrong Harry there, but um, and I, I think to Harry ask, Kane may not be Harry <laughs> Kane may not be crap, but boy, can he dribble. <laughs> what what are you saying? I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> oh no, I'm taking. I can't take. Uh, I, I can't make fun of people with lisps. That's just that's just wrong. That's wrong on every. You're, level. you know, you are your despicable. <laughs> despicable. Uh. So, our uh, anyway, we we have a um, obviously we have problems. We we are aware of this. We're going to solve them uh, as we go on. We have a new Skype account. It is at T double F S Live, which you can call right now, and you can speak to us. You can come on the program, speak to us for free. The phone number is still there, which is oh three thirty three three zero three forty eight sixty eight. But if you don't live in the UK and you can't call that number, there is an. Uh, Skype account at at T double F S live, which is also our Twitter account, by the way, where you can come and watch us on Periscope as well. Email the football fans show at gmail.com. Our website and our audio stream, quite frankly, this is an audio stream right now because our pictures keep freezing. <laughs> at dead air dot slash the football fan show, twitch.tv forward slash the football fan show, and just search for the uh, football fan show on YouTube. It's not the real football fan show, I should add. That's the idiots from Arsenal Fan TV who I despise. Do you do, by the way, as an Arsenal fan, do you do you think um, Arsenal Fan TV are a joke? Um, I think Arsenal Fan TV is probably a good idea that's fallen into bad hands. I think now that they've used it for marketing, because it was, so I've been watching them on and off for about the last three four years. And it started off as a thing for the fans, by the fans. Now it seems to be like a lot of sponsorship deals. I think, I think the guy who runs Lyle, he's done a good job to make money out of it. Off the back of it, some people have used it as a platform to... And I, and I think sometimes to see any other... Like, there's many other clubs who have their fan content um, on YouTube who, don't, who, haven't, um, who haven't talked down about their club as much as... Um, AFTV have um, um, but I think what they've done is really good it's a good idea to get fan interaction but I think it's I think 
it's fallen to the wayside a bit and given a lot of people um i mean it's good to give people a voice and it's good to give them a platform we gotta make sure you give the right people a platform if people are on there to just spew hate and negativity on there yeah absolutely and you know some of the the, some of the guys are like claude and dt who speak like they could do a better job than arsene wenger did in his time i can understand the as an arsenal fan i could understand the frustration of the last few years of wenger's but at the same time you've got to show respect to a man who managed to bring your club into that point in the first place because to be because if Wenger hadn't come and we were still playing the way we were, we wouldn't be complaining now about getting back in getting back into top four. We'd be complaining about why are we not fighting for top four. Problem is, is that we've been given a taste of that. I think what, with some Arsenal fans, they've been given a taste of some of that glory from the from the golden years during Wenger's uh, Wenger's tenure, and then just want to see a return to that, which is standard for a football fan. But a lot of the time, they've got to understand it comes comes with a process, it comes with time. You know, Mikel Arteta has only been in charge of the club for less than a year. I expect churning out these big results. You know, he's not yet had a chance to have, you know, a, he's had a full transfer window to build the team, but probably in the most tumultuous time in football with COVID-19. You give him a proper transfer window with the full amount of money he needs, no doubt he can build a team. Um, but I think AFTV, um, again, like I said, they are a good idea that's fallen into bad hands. It's like Facebook and Google. Excellent <laughs> ideas, but used for the wrong reasons. I mean, if you watch the social network, the film, he's just trying to pick up chicks. That's, that's a, by the way, that mm. film is not play that, 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 that film I should add, uh, does not take place in any semblance of reality. I just realized in my camera mm. that you can catch from you can look at how untidy my room is. Um, <laughs> lovely, lovely stuff. Um, we're going to go through the results now of your weekend football matches. I have to say there was a bit of a choice between the old firm and uh, Merseyside Derby. I chose the Merseyside Derby and what a game. What a game the Merseyside Derby was. It was... Everything I wanted and more, I was very, very satisfied with the Merseyside derby. It finished Everton 2, Liverpool 2. Now, the the biggest disappointment for me is that Liverpool were not undefeated going into this. But obviously, two weeks ago, we did kind of talk about the um, Aston Villa thrashing at the hands... (laughs) The... (laughs) The thrashing oh, that Aston suffered Villa. at the hands of Aston Villa. <laughs> and, oh boy, was it a fantastic, fantastic result uh, for for football. However, I will just say that in the Merseyside derby, that uh, Robertson uh, set up Mane for the first goal on the third minute, and it didn't take Liverpool long, as I say, to uh, score. Rodriguez set up... Uh, Keane on the 19th minute Calvert-Lewin on the 81st minute for Everton old though Mo Salah Mo Salah Mo Salah running down the wing on the 72nd minute um, sorry I just I, I love James anybody that covers those songs Richarlison was sent off on the 90th minute to add that bad blood to the Merseyside derby it has finished 2-2 Everton are still top of the Premier League. In fact, actually, everyone from Liverpool should take a picture of the uh, <laughs> the Premier League table right now because you got Everton top, Liverpool second, and Merseyside one two. Now what we need to do is get Tranmere into the Premier League, get them to third place. Then you can have a Merseyside top three or AFC Liverpool, or City and Liverpool <laughs> FC. You know, <laughs> take your pick. You can have. Um, if you listen closely, you can hear. Cry- you can hear that. You can hear crying in Scouse. <laughs> many of them, it's many of them, it's tears of sadness. Others, it's tears of happiness. It's just like, oh my god, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> By the way, he can make those jokes. His mum's Scouse. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Oh, Scouse mother. 
Oh, goodness. Right. Uh, Everton 2, Liverpool 2 was the score. Uh, your live game on a BT Sport box office. Have you paid fourteen ninety five to watch this one? You lost four... Actually, no, you actually, to be fair, you watched quite a good game, it turns out. Chelsea 3, Southampton 3. Maybe it was worth fourteen ninety five. Who, Who friggin' knows? Um, Werner, with the first goal on the 15th minute. Timo Werner, uh, with the first two goals, in fact. One on the 15th, one on the 28th minute. Ings, one of the most important players in Southampton's Arsenal, with the goal on the 43rd minute. Adams... Uh, with the equaliser on the 57th minute. Havertz with the goal for Chelsea, making it 3-2. And Vestergaard with the 92nd goal set up by Theo Walcott, of all people. So, Chelsea. This will be a disappointing result for them because they would have thought, oh, Southampton at home, nice three-pointer. You know something. Um, I know if... It was. It showed a steely determination from Southampton. I think um, a lot of people question their mentality after their nine nil drubbing last year at the under Leicester. So I think it showed a, a lot of bottle there because you know it shows that for Chelsea have spent money this transfer window. I mean they've spent big money, but at the same time it shows that you know your big unless your big players have that steely mentality and that um, ability to adapt and get into a game, then they're, you know, they're not, they're not going to get necessarily the results that you want. I mean, Southampton didn't make, they didn't have any like big money signings. They didn't have anyone that literally and fans, you know, literally watering at the mouth, but it showed that their team, when they work together, have a really, really good winning mentality. And I had a, and I had a funny thought earlier when I heard that Walcott got the assist um, as you know those memes, um, the Arsene Wenger's done it again memes. I can just picture one in my head of um, I can just picture one in my head just going Arsene Wenger sold Walcott to Everton, knowing that he'd be loaned to Southampton and assist in this game in order to deny Chelsea the win. Bloody Arsene Wenger, he's done it again. <laughs> oh goodness! I mean, gotta gotta love it, gotta love it. Um, Oh, well, you know, did you did you watch um complete side note from this? Did you watch Graham Norton last night? Because uh, Arsene Wenger was on that and he was talking about Jose Mourinho <laughs> about that that fisty cuffs he got into with Jose. It was f- actually hilarious. Do you know but what? Yes. I didn't wa- I didn't watch it, but now that you told me about that, I wish I did. I'm <laughs> sure I'll catch some highlights at some point. It's uh, it's a good watch. Anyway, uh, enough. Back to the football fan show. Uh, Man City won. Arsenal nil is the final score from that one. Sterling with the only goal of the game of the 23rd minute. The master beats... Okay, so I have one one issue with this match, and it's not nothing to do with the match at all. It is everything to do with the commentary on this match. That Mikel Arteta is somehow... Pep Guardiola's apprentice that Pep Guardiola taught Mikel Arteta everything he knows and they're painting it as like Mikel Arteta the lonely lower league player could never play alongside Man City he played for bloody Everton and Arsenal for God's sakes it's not like he played for Accrington Stanley come on guys (laughs) I have no I think I, th- I, th- I think Arsenal, in every respect, the players, the club, the manager, they always get done dirty. You know, they're always seen as, oh, your years are done. You know, what have you done? You know, if it's everything from the commentators saying, um, or people, or fans are saying that, you know, Arteta put out the cones for Pep. I mean, to be, if, if that's the case, then, if that's arousing the indictment of uh, Arteta's ability, well, then you can say to Pep, FA Cup semi-final last year, you got beaten by your kit man. <laughs> um, and I think, and I think some people look at they, they look at it, and they, and they and sometimes they make it sound like Arteta didn't have a brain, a footballing brain before exactly. he started working for Guardiola. And what and we got to realize is that this man came through this came through the Barcelona academy and played for Barcelona B for much of his youth career alongside one Xabi Alonso. Exactly. 
I mean, um, I don't get it. They treat him like... Sorry, go on. I mean, he went on to play for like... He went on to have a, a very good career. You know, he never played for any like small teams. He had success with Real Sociedad. He went to Rangers. He went to Everton. He went to Arsenal. And th- these are not these are not small teams. You know, these are not pl- teams where um, were regularly fighting for survival. These were teams that were either good mid table or were pushing on to do really really well. Yeah. And I think some and I think some people don't give. Arteta enough credit for the things that he's done in terms of firstly being able to get, get Aubameyang to sign a contract um, bringing the signings like he has done with Partey and Gabriel which according to um, several sources said that um, Stan Kroenke put his hand into his own pocket to uh, get the deadline day signing of Partey done um, so I think people really do not show Arsenal some of the respect that you know is warranted because they have done some amazing bits given the position they were in this time last year. And a lot of that has to go to Arteta because he's basically using the same crop of players that were bought last year and he's managed to get the best out of them. Whereas if you look at, whereas the common theme with Guardiola is that he's, he's described as the best manager in the world, but the best manager in the world, in my opinion, wouldn't spend four hundred, nearly half a billion pounds on defenders in five years and still only churn out what a c- couple of a couple of Premier League titles, the odd Carabao Cup, but still no European Championship. You know, if that was yeah. if that was any if that was any other manager who spent that kind of money and could not get what the ultimate prize in European football, they would have been sacked straight away. If that was someone like Chris I mean, Wilder, if that was someone like yeah, if that was a Chris Wilder or. Uh, um, a Sam Allardyce, or if that was, Shut imagine if Oli, Gu- imagine if um, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer spent that kind of money. Uh, you know, people. Does. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think your argument's very does. strong with that one. <laughs> no, but the fact is, is that. But then again, it just it just goes to show he spent that money, but they're calling for his head. Guardiola spent probably double that, and people still. Worship that the ground he walks on. Yeah, that's 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 true. Um, that is so true. It's it's a it's a double standard. It's like as soon as you throw a name into the conversation, you have to talk about the accomplishments. But with other names you throw into the conversation, you talk about their shortcomings. I mean, Man City. They wanted to since they've since they've had their been gunning for the Champions League, but every single manager before them has not been able to accomplish it you know Mal- Pellegrini and Mancini accomplished more I'd say with the city side that they have than Guardiola has achieved with this city side but yeah. Manci- Mancini and Pellegrini don't get a mention you know no. it's easy it's easy to it's easy to say Guardiola it's easy to say Guardiola is the best coach in the world but it's, but at the same time, when he, his coaching resume says Barcelona, Bayern Munich, and Man City, the good thing is is that when you have unlimited oil wealth and some of the best facilities and players that money can buy behind you, it's easy to look the best. You know, if you look at if you look at Pellegrini, he man he was manager of Porto, I think, and he managed to make them one of the better teams in Portugal. But Porto aren't known to be massive spenders. If anything, they're known for quite. They have quite, quite a decent youth academy. Same with Benfica and a lot of those other teams around Europe. But given looking at the level, of, you, it's easy to look at the number of trophies a manager has won. But at the same time, you've got to look at the means and the methods of what they did to achieve them. Do you think Guardiola could achieve the same success if he had? Um, if he was manager of, say, someone like Aston Villa or uh, Fulham or Everton or West Brom or things like that. I mean, I think I think probably the best manager in the Premier League at the moment is probably a toss-up for me between Marcelo Bielsa and Carlo Ancelotti. Because Carlo Ancelotti, I don't know what, he, he's managed to bring some absolute firepower to this Everton team. Not in terms of striking, but in terms of belief. You look at Dominic Calvert-Lewin, you know, he was a couple of seasons ago he was struggling mm. to knock, knock goals in now 
he is the highest scorer across the top five leagues. You know, he's, you know, the only time during England's two games when they played Belgium and Denmark, the only time where England looked genuinely threatening or really good on the attack is when they had Calvert Lewin at the front. Yeah. But that's because that's because England's style is more negative. And that kind of suits Harry Kane. Whereas pressing on uh, pressing on the players, I mean that front three when they played against um who were they? It was um no, who was it they where um when Dominic Calvert Lewin scored, they were playing Wales. When they were playing Wales. Yeah, it was Wales, yeah. That 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 front three, Grealish, Dominic Calvert Lewin and Danny Ings. They were they were players that were hungry. They wanted to fight. They wanted to fight. They were taking, they weren't taking pot shots. They were creating really really good chances. But then when you see the the supposed superstar players come into the England setup, so on paper, look at it. When you say your front three is Sterling, Kane, and Jaden Sancho, yeah, literally makes literally makes every football fan, you know, make a mess in their trousers. <laughs> but when you see it on the pitch and you see how negatively they play. For me, international football is a snore fest. I tend to switch off from football whenever there's an international break on. See, I, I, I love, I do, I do genuinely love international football. But um, watching England is should come with a health warning before every game. That uh, heartbreak mm. is guaranteed. Uh, I. Oh yeah. I do remember, like when we were kids, England were it was the golden generation, but they were absolutely rubbish. Like they couldn't play together, mm-hmm. um, which I, mm-hmm. I always they they always said, oh, you know, it's all about uh, you know the fact that we play for rival clubs. You know, mm-hmm. we you know we're all enemies on the pitch, and I'm like, no, that is the biggest load of rubbish. Is the best word. If, I'm if, um, if if you look at if you want if you want an example, let's take El Clasico in Spain. Sergio Ramos and Gerard Piquet are on opposite sides of two of the biggest cl- clubs in Spain, and if not the world. Yet to what? Yeah, during their World Cup winning year, their World Cup winning year with Spain and the subsequent seasons before that, playing for Spain, they were the most dominant defensive pairing on the planet. If you rewind back to 2009, 2010, and you're an attacker and you're saying, all right, you're going to be marked by either uh, Ramos or PK, chances are, as an attacker, you'd shit yourself. Apologies for the language. Don't uh, worry. Um, um, no but swearing. At the, but at the same... Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's... Um, you, can't, you can't say, oh, we play for rival clubs, therefore we don't know how to play together. You're, you know, you're... If anything, you've played against each other more, so you should have an idea of how each other plays best more so than you this, would do against. Best example of this is Lampard and Gerrard, because everyone used yeah. to take the mick out of them for not being able to play together. Even though, yeah. okay, yeah, they both pretty much did the same job for their respective clubs, but come on, lads, yeah. just put your selfish pride but aside have... and work hard. But you had two guys who literally were the same player for. They were identical players for their clubs. You so could, one was in, one was out. Yeah, in my in my view, one of them, sh- one of them should be in, should have been out. I mean, if in my opinion, I would have said Stephen Gerrard should have been in and Lampard out. Yeah, we because were on the same Lampard page all, there. Lampard, all right, is a goal scorer, which is absolutely fantastic. You know, he has the most goals out of any Chelsea player in history. But the thing is, is that in that golden generation, we had goal scorers. You know, yeah, people like on his day when he kicked on Michael Owen, he was fabulous in front of goal. People like uh, Michael Owen, Beckham could smash a free kick in. So I'm unsh- I'm unsure as to why they play them together. We shall never know. But in my view, Gerard does more of the spade work. He likes to get stuck in. He'll run at people. You know, he may not get all the goals. But that's what your strikers are for. But he'll put that spade work in. He'll come forward, but he'll also protect that back four. Uh, um, if, if you've noticed something, and this, is, and this is something that's just cropped up in my mind, if you notice something, that was England's supposed golden generation between like 1999 and 2002, 2003. Have I you mean, noticed it, the golden you'd generation? You'd really extend it, sorry to interrupt, but you'd probably extend it to about 2007, 2008 with Rooney and 
and that lot. So. Ah, yeah, but when you when you look at that, then so if you go to like two thousand eight, nine, and ten, and you look who we had in the squad, two thousand and ten will. Um, I think it was what was it the two thousand and ten World Cup? Uh, yeah, goalkeeper, South Africa. David. Yeah, goalkeeper David James. In that yeah. game against Germany. I remember I know, Joe Hart making Green. a mistake. Rob Green making a mistake, sorry. Um, yeah, Rob Green making a mistake. He wasn't a very good goalkeeper. Joe Hart. Where am I? Um, I Which think 2006 World Cup was... was David James's World Cup. Yeah, 2006. No, Germany 2006 two... he played. No. Um... no, 2006 was Paul Robinson. Because that's when um, we went out on penalties to Portugal. When um, Rooney got sent off for standing on uh, Carvalho's groin. Oh, yeah, and Cristiano Ronaldo. That. Uh, <laughs> doing the cheeky wink but cheeky wink from Ronaldo is, um, but then again looking in that game we lost against Germany 4-1 in that tournament you know we had a good attack with people like Rooney but nothing nothing behind that you know it was I mean who was our defence we had David James in goal for some reason Matthew Upson was in our defence we had Paul Kincheski and things like that you oh, know. Paul Kincheski, I remember that. But these, uh, these players that don't, these players that don't grab any names at all. But um, what my original point was, if you've noticed that every single during this time, and this is the same around the world for any club, if you've noticed that every single country has a golden age of players, like what players are quite fashionable to get, or which players become expensive. So between 1999 and I'd say 2007, you know, well, 1999 to 2002, it was quite fast. It was quite a big thing to have an English player on board. Mm. After the 2002 World Cup, every decent team in Europe had a Brazilian player in it. You know, <laughs> you know, like you, know, you had like a like AC Milan in Europe when they had people like Cafu and Rivaldo, Barcelona oh, yeah, would turn yeah, it up. Yeah. They had. Ronaldinho in there. Ronald, uh, um, fat Ronaldo. Ronaldo. Fat Ronaldo <laughs> was uh, knocking them. You know, it was quite fashionable to have a Brazilian. Uh, Roberto the Carlos. And that, yeah. Roberto Carlos, yeah. And then after that, it was quite fashionable to have um, a German player in the team. Uh, 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 no, not a German player. It was a Spanish player. You Spanish, know, so. Italian like and then Spanish, yeah. Yeah. Um, but and then it was a and then it was a German and then it was a French and now and now at the moment it's French players like French players you know you could buy an absolute nobody winger from a low level French team it will still probably set the club back about 20 30 million yeah you know um, but i don't see even if england did win a major tournament i don't i just don't see that happening i don't think england english players can adapt to foreign leagues unless they go very early on like a jaden sancho or a jude bellingham um, because we saw at that, at, if you look at the Galacticos project, I mean, Steve McManaman never really set the world on fire at Real Madrid, neither did Michael Owen. I mean, you could even argue Owen, Owen Hargreaves wasn't brilliant at uh, Bayern Munich. Real Madrid. Um, Real Madrid, yeah. Um, but it, it, then you look at that Real Madrid team and you think, oh, David Beckham was pretty tasty on the free kicks. Um, why are we talking about this? Harry Maguire is the England, uh, the uh, the Manchester United captain. So, before we go to a break, should we uh, just say whether or not the England team, after his red card, should Harry Maguire ever, ever be called up? To the England team again. My opinion is no, you have now forfeited your right to play for England. Bye bye. Enjoy going and ending your career in the National League because you are a different level of crap. Um, but then again, I really don't care for a player's mental health as long as, a, as if you're a striker, you're scoring goals, that's all you're good for. You're a midfielder, if you're supplying the ball to the strikers or playing defensively, that's all you're good for. And if a if a defender, as a defender, if you're getting sent off or um, letting players pass you easily, that's where you're useless to me and I couldn't give a stuff about you. I'd be a very bad manager because I'd annoy a lot of players. Because I'd just say, if you're not good, get out of the team. You know where the exit door is. And I kind of feel that 
way towards Harry Maguire and the England situation. First of all, I don't think he should have been back in the team after the whole Greece thing anyway, which, okay, can we blame the Greeks for this? <laughs> that's That thought has just uh, entered my mind because, uh, you know, that's, that's a thing that happened. Uh, being found guilty of aggravated assault in Greece. But I just, I don't see how he gets back in the England team. Um, so does he get, yeah, just quickly, yes or no, because I want to ask you one more thing about England. Yes or no, does Harry Maguire, for you, get back in the England team? Um, I would say not right now, because mentally he's not in he's not in the right frame of mind. It's been a difficult six to eight weeks for him. Um, so I think he needs to take time away from international duty to focus on getting things right at club level, first of all, because club level is really where the uh, people like the press and the media and social media will go in on him for his performances at United. I think he needs to focus on that first before getting another England caller. At the, at, to be fair, we're not short of options when it comes to people who can play at the back. Um, I think, um, I'll tell you, who, the person who I rate more a lot more than I would Harry Maguire as Connor Cody from Wolves. He put in an absolute shift against Wales. I think I think what happens is that you get these players who then become regular England call-ups and they lose their fight, whereas you see players like Connor Cody, like your Calvert-Lewins, who will come in and fight, who come in and put in a shift because of the occasion, you know. They're not these players that expect to get picked every time. Um... But I think for now, Harry Mag- I would say Harry Maguire probably needs to stay away from the England side for probably the next six months. And quickly, uh, um, Jack Grealish, should he have come off the bench against Denmark? I think Jack Grealish, I think Jack Grealish should have started. <laughs> yes. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I because, think we're, we're both in agreement there. The problem is, is that Jack, the great thing about Jack Grealish is the fact that he can play in any position behind a front player. So he can play on the wing, he can play as a false nine, he can play as a number 10, he can He's play very versatile, as a box, yeah. box midfielder. He's very versatile. And I yeah. think that's something that we don't have enough in the England squad. You know, you'll never see... Um, we have no, we don't have that many versatile players. Like Jordan Henderson can sit deep and he can go box to box if he wants to. He can spray a pass and that's it. Um, Carl Walker, fairly versatile, can play as a right back a wing-back, or he can play the right-sided centre-back in a back three. Sterling, winger, can't play through the middle. We saw that with Liverpool in his early part of his career. Um, Kane can play nowhere other than target man striker. Yeah. Um, and then you have people like, if John Joe Shelby was in the team, he can't play in any other position. Um You've got Calvin Phillips, who um, who's just come into the squad. I don't think he can play in any other position than he does now. But people like Jack Grealish, who can li- you could basically say to him before a game, saying, OK, sticks to the position, but Jack, you can free roam anywhere around the front three. You can free roam around there. You can swap with Sterling. You can swap with Ings. You can make darting runs. You can come deep, receive the ball, and you can carry it. People, look, You can do that with Jack Grealish. And I think that's a creativity that England need because there's no versatile. There, there are no versatile players in that England squad apart from I would say Jack Grealish probably being the big standout one. Yeah, complete agreeance with you. I yeah, I, I I like Grealish. I I understand why people were losing their collective minds over him when um when he decided to ditch Ireland for England. Um, because obviously he could play for the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, I, I kind of don't understand why, why why Gareth Southgate didn't like didn't put him on. Maybe because he just doesn't like Aston Villa, even though he used to play for them. Although the Villa fans don't like the fact that he left for Middlesbrough. Maybe that's a thing. Conspiracy. I have no idea. Anyway, let's move on and talk about Premier League football after. A, the break welcome back to the football fan show and hopefully we will be live again on all the all the streaming platforms such as twitch facebook youtube and periscope i am checking my phone rather rudely to see if that is happening i hope so yay pictures are moving okay uh 
knocking over bottles. However, we are back. Live with you through till 10. Let's talk about Prem Plus or pay-per-view football. We're going to save Project Big Picture till 9. You've missed our England Harry Maguire chat. Don't worry if you uh, weren't able to catch the live stream. We've recorded every, every segment. We have recorded every segment of the show. And this, and I forgot to hit record on this one. So this one is now recording as well. Um, every segment is being recorded. You can go watch them on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, football, and it is pay-per-view football. By the way, it's Newcastle United 1, uh, Manchester United 0. Completely forgot about this match because normally it would be on TV. But the Premier League clubs elected, voted in their infinite wisdom. I feel like I had to do like a Saki... Saki announced a voice then. In their infinite wisdom. Infinite wisdom. To put all the Premier League in matches behind a paywall. They put all say, the you'd matches. never guess you worked in radio, would you? No, absolutely not. Uh, they put all the matches behind... Um, they've put them... The ones that shouldn't be on TV, they've now put behind a paywall. Uh, fourteen pounds ninety-five to buy them from either Sky Sports box office or BT Sport box office. And did you did you know that there is a precedent for this, Tom? Um, <laughs> there is a. Precedent I mean, I can understand their reason for doing it. I mean, I can understand their reason for doing it. They've got to, the clubs have got to find a way to make the money that they lost from, you know, no ticket money. But uh, um, well, well, Sky have tried this in the past with a channel called Prem Plus, which was active from two thousand and one. Yes, it. <laughs> yes, no, it didn't. It did not go down well. Um, from August of 2001 to May of 2007, Prem Plus was active across uh, the Sky platform. So essentially what, what it was is you paid your Sky subscription and then they'd put like the 5 o'clock game on a Saturday or the late game on a Sunday on pay-per-view. So you'd have to spend an additional fee on that. To be fair, and it because it looks like I'm just uh, bitching about Sky here, to be fair... ITV Digital did it as well with ITV Sports Select. God, I remember those uh, the, those times. Although by by 2003, ITV Digital had gone uh, bankrupted, and half the football league went with it. Thanks, ITV. <laughs> but Prem Plus, yeah, it didn't really catch on. Uh, there was a um, uh, the first match featured was Chelsea versus uh, Newcastle United. So it was another Chelsea game kicking off this generation of pay-per-view football matches. What is it that Chelsea, about Chelsea that screams pay-per-view? Their box office stuff, clearly. Although, to be fair, Chelsea, Chelsea Southampton better be first on match of the day. Because <laughs> that looks like a good game. Uh, matches could be purchased by the telephone. And in later seasons, you could activate it through your skybox. I'm just, re- I'm just reading it. I'm just reading the Wikipedia page for Prem Plus, to be honest. This is going to drive people to piracy because that's all the comments. All the comments are piracy, 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 piracy. I'm not spending £14.95 to watch bloody Burnley take on West Bromwich Albion. Why would I do that? And why in these difficult times does the Premier League think it's acceptable to charge people when unemployment is... This, this is a party election broadcast um, from the Football Fan Show Party. Um, why does the Premier League find it acceptable to go, you know what, times are tough for everyone in the country. We're just going to charge you £14.95 to watch your favourite club. How much do I follow, by the way? Because um, I, EFL I follow charges, but they don't charge that much to for you to stream, stream um, matches. How much is it? Uh, I follow is ten pounds for a match pass, so you can have. I think it's ten pounds to watch it, and then it. I think you can have five pounds for an audio pass, so you can listen to it like you would on the radio. 
But then again, that defeats the purpose because then you could just flick onto the appropriate radio station if you live locally. Yeah. So. <laughs> BBC Wiltshire. Um, although they're all going to get cut very soon. Uh, I would say that the kind of the 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 testicular fortitude of the Premier League. The only there was only one club that voted against this, and this is where they get praise: Leicester City, Leicester voted against it the people's club soon they'll have like the soviet union national anthem playing before champions league matches a <laughs> <laughs> uh, picture of karl marx replacing the uh, fox the people's club uh, I, I can't believe they're the only only club that voted against it do you cuz you've said you understand why they're doing it i'm i'm of the opposite opinion i can't understand why why they're doing it i think the premier really? league should take it on the chin and just accept they're going to lose money, but they're going to survive. The National League is going to lose money. They might not survive. League Two is going to lose money. They probably won't survive. League One is going to lose money. And we know, uh, you and I know a, a particular team in League One that we both care about. <laughs> Hopefully that team will survive. But League One will take a, a, a beating. Maybe the championship will be all right, but come on. The Premier League, that is just callous. That is just callous money grabbers from the idiots that brought you Project Big Picture as well, which we'll get onto later. But go on. What, you put, you put me down hey. if you want, but I, that is my arrogant opinion. Don't get, hey, don't get me wrong. I did say I understand why they're doing it. Never said I agreed with it. <laughs> um, I, it's, Again, it does look like a shameless money grab from the Premier League teams. You know, they've, you know, the these are uh, these teams who were publicly traded, you know, or privately owned, you know, shareholders who desire results in terms of the in terms of um, dividends and things like that. Whereas the teams lower in the league, like lower in the football pyramid, you know, who are locally owned. You know, not so much whose day to day isn't to give a dividend to their shareholders, but to you know get through the get through the year. Because at the end of the day, as much you know, it's one of those ones that it's an industry where the world would carry on if if, it, if there was no football, but. At the same time, you can't have the the teams with the most exposure showing their true colours that it is just a money grab, and then not expect any repercussions from it. Um, you can't. You can't. Yeah, go on. Because there'll, there'll there'll be a backlash to it. You know, people. You know, because of the financial hardship that people are experiencing, people will tune out. Of you know, if you're if you're saying babe, Basically, to me, what they're saying is we're in a pandemic. We can't have you in the stadium. However, we understand that you've probably lost your job or you're probably on furlough and you're on a lot less pay. Or, we'll, or we understand that you may have a PhD, but now you're delivering pizzas because where you work is now closed and delivering food is the only job available. But you know what? What we'll do is we'll give you access to the football as long as you just pay this fee which will help support these multi-billion pound clubs get the through this pandemic. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're... That's essentially what they're that? saying, is that they're saying, we, I, I, we I, need I... to rely on the fans to help save these billion dollar corporations from going under, because we're, we, we want, because we're not fleecing them at the gates and the stands, we're, we want to fleece them from their tellies. Oh, I feel sorry. You've made me. You've brought me to tears. I feel so. I feel so sorry for these billionaires. <laughs> I know. I can. I can just picture Paul Roman Abramovich right now. Just he's had to sell one yacht. <laughs> you know, know what? The I've got. Blokes, there's the there's a horrible smell around here. I think it's called bullshit. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, I sorry. Mean, I, I now did a sweary. That's... Sorry. I must apologise. Um. Well, that's that's just that's just Swindon's natural musk. We, me, and you both know that we've lived it all most I of our the lives. The natural musk was uh, marijuana, but anyway, speaking of uh, illegal substances, <laughs> you know what? I genuinely think the Premier League should just go the whole hog and just scrap broadcast rights 
and just create Premier League Live. Nine ninety nine a month. You get access to every game. You get original documentary. It's like a Premier League Netflix. And you know what? They'd make more money as as a collective. They'd get more money if they did it on a global basis. Because mm. and actually, okay. if they just did it on a national basis, they uh, they'd make more money because people are looking at it, going. So I'm a sucker because I I pay for both Sky and BT. Net Sky Sports through Now TV cost me twenty five pound a month. A BT Sport monthly pass is twenty one pounds a month. That's fifth, uh, just under fifty quid. For, and I'm just using it for football. I'm not interested in rugby. Okay, yeah, maybe I use Sky for Formula One as well. But I'm not interested in... I'm not interested in BT Sports coverage of rugby. I'm not interested in WWE. I'm not interested in... Um, motorcycle racing. MotoGP. I'm not into Speedway. So I'm, I'm literally using BT for its football content. Okay, yeah, you can argue... It has one game per weekend. It has the Champions League, the Europa League as well. Okay, you're paying for that a bit. Quite frankly, I could do without the Champions League and the Europa League because I haven't watched it in years anyway. So I could do without it. I don't care. They just put the finals on YouTube every year. That's fine. I can watch it there. So I can live my life without watching the Champions League and just subscribe to Sky and just watch all the... But actually, I'd rather just pay nine ninety nine a month and watch all the Premier League games because that's all I want to watch. I I'm not interested in Scottish football. I'm not interested in French football. I'm not really that interested in German football unless you're um, the, in the third division and called 1860 Munich. Um, other than that, I'm really not that interested in any other league other than the Premier League. I, I don't care enough about them. And maybe I should because, you know, we do this. But I don't care enough about them to want to watch them. I just want to watch the Premier League. And that's it. I'd rather pay nine ninety nine a month for a Premier League subscription service than paying fourteen ninety five to watch Burnley versus West Brom and Champion. Because if I'm paying nine ninety nine a month for every game, I'm gonna ch I'm gonna go Everton versus Liverpool for nine ninety nine a month. Yes, Burnley and West Brom. I think I might give that one a miss personally. <laughs> mm. The thing, the thing is, the see, it sounds to me somewhat someone's taken an idea from the WWE Network. I think you know. I think that's a great if, example. Do you, I th do you know? I think what they sh what would be ideal is if they had a monthly subscription service for. Uh, f not just for each of the sports that people like. So let's say they have Sky Sports Rugby, Sky Sports Cricket, Sky Sports Golf, Sky Sports um, Football. Do you want me to list and things like that? And list off every like, channel they've had. So they've got news, main event, which is uh, kind, yeah. kind of uh, all encompassing. Sky Sports Premier League, Sky Sports Cricket, Sky Sports NFL now, Sky Sports F1 which becomes Sky Sports Dance over Christmas. Don't ask me why. Um, they've got Sky Sports uh, Mix. Uh, they've yeah. got Sky Sports Golf. They've got Cricket. Um, it's insane the amount of channels you get. And by the way, I can watch them all on a Now TV pass. Please sponsor us, Now TV. Um, I can watch them all. Once. I'm just not interested yeah. in any of them. I'm thinking is what you could do with the monthly subscription service that you mentioned. Do it nine ninety nine a month for because um, then people can pick and choose the sports that they follow. You know, someone's not going to pay if you make it all encompassing. Say nine ninety nine a month, you get all the Sky Sports bits. People are not going to pay nine ninety nine if they follow probably one if they follow one sixteenth of the sports that is, are on offer. You know, you're not going to pay the full whack nine ninety nine. So make it individual ones. So make package ones. So you could say um, nine ninety nine a month. You get football, rugby, cricket. You know, give it, give them the t like the sports where England tend to do well sometimes. Um, and then you can have like additional passes, like um, you know, someone who just follows basketball and NFL are not going to want an all. Are not going to see. They're not going to pay nine ninety nine if it comes with all the other sports as well. 
because then they're thinking they're paying extra for things they for something they won't use. Whereas if they can pay for something that is basically just what they want, it's like like WWE's one. They have the WWE Network nine ninety nine a month. People people go to WWE for wrestling content. They go for matches and they go for bits out like behind the scenes. That's literally all they want, and the network gives them to them, and that's why. WWE saw a massive rise in the people subscribing to the network. Sky Sports, I think, needs to adopt a similar thing. You're basically, uh, yeah. uh, if you think, if you think how many people have subscribed, to, how many, how many people during this time of the pandemic do you think have signed up to Netflix? Oh, loads. Can, but, but before, but, okay. So I need to interrupt you and say I'm not laughing because. Uh, at what you're saying, I'm laughing at who has scored the Manchester United equaliser. <laughs> Do you want to have Let me a guess? guess. Who? Was it a Bruno Fernandez? It's a Bruno Fernandez penalty. Nope. <laughs> we were talking about him earlier. Yeah. Oh, was it Harry <laughs> Maguire? Yes. The 23rd oh, yeah. minute. Wow. Harry Maguire. <laughs> and we were talking about the Manchester United captain. Hashtag Manchester United captain. Um, I think I'm going to put it on a t-shirt. Although, if he's cost loads of penalties, why did you get sent off for England? Uh, sorry, that was that is why I was laughing. I was not laughing at what you were saying. I just saw Harry Maguire yeah, had scored on the right. 23rd minute and was just like, what? <laughs> what? Um, he was assisted by oh, one crap, matter. Oh, crap, in. Oh, crap in my crap in. Oh, crap in my crap in. <laughs> well, maybe not so crap in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but the point I was de- trying to make. Ugly. Oh yeah. Um, the point I was trying to make is that actually Premier League revenue, individual club revenue, would go up if they just charged a flat fee of nine ninety nine, and I think you would get a lot more casual, uh, casual fans that way, because then they'll say, oh, I could spend twenty five quid on both. Sky Sports and, and BT Sport, and to be fair, the only reason I subscribe to both is both is because I do this. Um, weirdly, I never used to actually like football, um, but if you offered all the games for a low, low price of like nine ninety nine for something, you could imagine. You could like you know that GIF of um, that meme of Fry from Futurama, the "Shut up and take my money." I'll shut up and you can take my oh, money absolutely. because that is awesome for nine ninety nine. I would pay, yeah. and, and it doesn't even have to have original content. You know, you don't have to do the Premier League review or anything or any documentaries like that. I'll just watch a football on there or the Premier League year. Although that's a Sky thing, the Premier League years. Although if they did their own version of that, I'd probably watch that. Definitely. Uh, let's let's um let's look at it this way then. So. And it's it's a blatant, you can tell it's a blatant cash grab. So if you do the math, so let's say for argument's sake you're paying fifteen, so it's fourteen ninety nine, but we'll round it up to fifteen for argument's sake. So if one person follows one team and their all their team's games are on the pay per view, so in one month, team will play an average five to six games. Yeah. Mm. Um. So what that means then is. What the team will then pay, someone will pay fifteen pounds a game. That would be about what seventy five pounds a month just watching football. You know, you wanna, spend you wa- spending more than what spending more on you're spending more money watching football than you would do on your water bill or some people's council tax. Even you're basically asking, saying, okay, if you want to watch the football, these games that you you want to watch. You've got to pay us this money, and it's a big drop in the water. And that works out, you know, if it's seven, roughly seventy-five pounds a month. That, at the end of it all, once you, once you found that seventy-five pounds a month, that would be around about what nine hundred pounds a year just on watching football. Nine hundred pounds a year. You know what really annoys people, me. Uh, for, for fifteen, for, sorry, for for fourteen ninety five, you can watch one Premier League game. For fifteen quid in Canada, you can buy Dazan and stream every Premier League game per month live. Mm. So yeah. just get a um, just get one of those um, IP vanish things. Switch your IP address to Canada. Pay for Dazan. 
There you go. 15 quid a month. You can watch every Premier League game. Don't... <laughs> By the way, don't take up that advice. It's very illegal. But just well, do it. Let's, let's flip it the other... Let's flip it the other way then. Let's look at um, how much money they could make out of the fans doing the nine ninety nine a month uh, subscription service. Let's say so that means, by by and large, the, the majority of fans won't pay fourteen ninety five every time to watch a game. Only the people who have got the income to do so would do that, or if their team's playing. At the moment, the way they're doing it is they're having one game a day. De- one game a day on that paper on that pay per view service, and you're going to have some fans tune in, some fans not. For nine, that means that you you're potentially alienating a lot of your fan base because a lot of people, you know, times tough and money's an es- and um, football's an escape, mm. and money's money's an object, money's tight. You know, I mean, if you look at say, let's take Swindon Town for example, none of the Swindon Town fans are millionaires. They go there for the experience; it's an escape. But I as don't as you know. Start I'm charging quite well it. off. <laughs> no, I don't um, mean Sorry. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just for a cheap joke. Um, but the, yeah, absolutely. But the um, the flip side of it is, as soon as you introduce it nine ninety nine, it's it has the same mentality as Netflix. People pay the nine ninety nine a month because sometimes they want to binge watch. They'll binge watch stuff on Netflix. They'll go through entire seasons. If you put games like that on there, then they can go through highlights, show up with their mates. People who miss live matches because they're either working or doing something can go back and revisit that game later on. You know, finish watching it later on because they've got that subscription. Take if you th- take um, all those fans. Say the average attendance of a stadium's what thirty thousand. If you've got thirty thousand people paying nine ninety nine or let's say ten pounds a month. From those 30,000 people, so from the rough average of a full stadium in the Premier League, 30,000 people paying a tenner a month. That's £300,000 you've made in one month from the spectatorship of one small club, a small Premier League club. Yeah. And then when you get more of the casual, and then when you start getting more of the casual fans in who will start to sign up to see what's on offer, to see what it's all about, that's where you make extra money. You know, if you can get a hundred, a hundred thousand people signed up to one, for one month, that gives you a million pounds a month. Makes economic sense to do it that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and even though I, I'd like to point this out, they have a Premier League app that I have on my phone, the PL app. It has the Premier League logo and everything. It is just easy to just add a subscription fee for, to that and say, okay, nine ninety nine. you can watch all the games, you can watch it in all the angles, listen to whatever pundit you want, don't hire Robbie Savage. Um, in fact, actually... And even, it, and, and even, whilst, even whilst you're doing that, what an amazing thing would be, would Padiz link that with the Fantasy Football League so you can watch in live time the stock value of your player in your Fantasy League go up or down that actually would be that is that is something i hadn't actually thought of well done that is a fantastic idea it would just be so easy to do but like we've like i've said in previous episodes you know it's it's too easy and it's too obvious so they won't go for it they can't go for it because it's too easy and obvious so they should have a net a, a premier league a netflix a, a premier league Netflix like they should have a Netflix of the Premier League is what I'm trying to say um with original content and I have think you ever the seen EFL should be the same thing I will get to the EFL because I've got some very strong opinions on that but um have you ever seen on Netflix the drive to survive I know it's formula 1 but could you imagine if you've uh, ever seen that go watch some clips it's a really good show because it just shows the pressure that F1 drivers are under could you imagine instead of all or nothing where it's just a puff piece about Tottenham that you actually get a like a live feed into the dressing room at half time or something so you can watch say Chris Wilder give his team talks or something like that i know that's incredibly intrusive into a manager's um working 
But quite frankly, most of it is known anyway by the fans. So why not yeah. do that and go that extra mile and give the fans yeah, that, I'd love... th- that more in-depth? Mic up the referees as well and the officials so we understand... Maybe we can talk to them during, like, maybe that's, the commentator can talk to them during a match and just say, well, you made this decision. You decided to give that as an offside. What What did you notice? Or something? You know, go the extra mile. Mm. Mike, I would, I agree. Mic up the referees to see what's saying. Will be a, not necessarily mic them up during the game, but I would say mic up the VAR official. Oh, yes. Yes, mic up the VAR official. If you're official. going to keep VAR... If you're going to keep VAR, you need to make it as transparent as possible and you need to mic up the assistant in there. You I would either that give 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 the commentators a direct feed to the VAR assistant as to what decision they're going to make. Give them that transparency because it makes the fans understand, it makes the players understand, and people understand how certain decisions are made. Because as soon as you start being transparent with the decision making then there won't be any of this debate of oh does VAR work for the game is it destroying the game is it enhancing it because people are looking at decision making and drawing their own conclusions from it they're dreaming up the methods that these officials have ar- that have used and the decisions they've arrived at as soon mm. as you are transparent as soon as you can hear what they're saying for decision making like that um, Eric Dyer handball um, yeah which ultimately gave, which cost Tottenham three points. If yeah. you can hear, if you can hear the decision making going on between the official and the VAR assistant, then you can understand why he's made it. Because then people just speculate, saying, "Why has he done it? It's killing the game. Is it because his hand was in an unnatural position? Does he think that there's genuine attempt for him to obstruct the ball with his hand? Things like that. You know. Yeah. I'm- Absolutely. I think, I think I think miking up the VAR assistant would be the most beneficial. We're not not just the referee. And I say that from a I, I can agree I can understand it from a business standpoint. So if you think some of the things that the players will probably shout in the referee's face during a questionable decision a pre watershed who doesn't want to hear what the players are saying. Yeah. But you're online. If you if you're streaming you do, the same rules don't apply. Uh, watershed mm. rules don't apply to online streaming services. You can you can do even if yeah. you're live broadcasting on a streaming service, you can swear whenever you like, uh, um, as long as the streaming except, service is okay with it. Yeah, except on Twitch, of course, um, which we very much uh, enjoy broadcasting on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think what you need, uh, what it is, is the. The VAR assistants need to be mic'd up so we can hear and understand how they've arrived at certain decisions. And that way it takes away a, a lot of this divide that VAR has amongst fans and pundits alike. Um, and at the same time, um, I th- think it should be not necessarily, um, not necessarily hold like Sky hostages over such thing, but encourage them to make the subscription service by showing, you know, corporations like that will only see money. They'll see pound signs, you know. They'll, yeah. they'll never see anything else. They'll never understand any other language. But what they say about helping the fans or bringing the fans to the game, it's basically where they can find to make money in a difficult time. As soon as you introduce a subscription service, the casual fan signs in, and then you've got them because they'll all, there's enough content, there's enough variety on there to keep any casual fans who are not dedicated to any one particular sport hooked in. You'll get the fans who be at the gate. You're, so, if, so think of it this way. Teams will make money. So the, a, a lot of teams will make money from the ticket revenue of fans coming in, especially mm. Premier League teams. They could easily make them... Um, from the fans for the charges they, uh, the prices they charge for the Premier League clubs could probably easily make a million a game. Oh, absolutely, what, absolutely. What, what these subscription services then do to benefit them? You know, you've made money off the people who've turned up at the games. They've bought the shirt, they've bought food, they've bought a ticket, they've bought a match, uh, they've bought a match program. You know, things like that. But how do you how do you make money from the fans sitting at home watching the game? 
you, you can you can stick an advertisement on there, but that t- takes up airtime, you know, and that costs their money. So the subscription service, people signing on to that subscription service means that Sky makes money and they pay a percentage of that pot to the clubs that have that, you know, to the Premier League clubs whose rights and TV deals go through that subscription service. So that way, the Premier League and the clubs are making money from the fans who didn't go to the game. Whereas mm. normally, the, the clubs only make money from the 50 or so thousand fans that make the journey. So it makes more business sense to make money from them and from the people watching from their sofas. Premier League streaming service, take all of our ideas. I'm going to just call my um, trademark lawyer. Um, I wish I had one. Uh, <laughs> We have got just a few minutes to get into the hour, lo- uh, well, what I'm hoping will be an hour long chat. Chat rant from me about Project BS, as I like to nickname it. Um, Real Madrid lost today. 1 0. The worst manager in world football lost. Um, Cadiz. I'm so rubbish at names. C A D I Z. And they're currently second. Behind Real Madrid, also on 10 points. Getafe nil, Barcelona nil currently. And Sevilla lost to Granada, not the TV company. Uh, Cal- Celta Vigo nil, Atletico Madrid 2. Um, Celta Vigo. Celta Vigo. I don't know. Uh, this is this is an argument we could get into. Is it is it Celtic or Celtic? Celta Vigo. It's Celta Vigo to, to a number of people, but to me it's Celt. It's Celtavigo, so it should be even Glasgow. It's called Celtic, not Celtic. Anyway, uh, speaking of Celtic, uh, they they had an abysmal day today. Lost two 0 to Steve Gerrard Gerrard's Rangers. Two 0 Did you see the um? There's a clip going around of um. Of of the match and it's uh, I can't remember which um, I can't remember which Rangers player it is. It is Morelos and he he literally they're going for a corner and he smacks like uh, Scott Brown around the back of the head. Now Scott Brown just looks at him and Scott Brown has the look of a man that if you even sneezed in his direction he'll stab you with a knife. <laughs> Mm. So he must yeah. have some big cojones. Uh, Scott, <laughs> Scott Brown's got a stare. Scott Brown's got a stare that would put uh, coronavirus in isolation for fourteen days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Anyway, yeah, it finished Celtic nil. Uh, Rangers to Godolson with both goals in the ninth and the fifty-fourth minute. Rangers potentially justifying Steve Gerrard as their manager, considering I thought he was going to be an absolute epic failure. Kind of unhappy that he isn't. Catholic, Irish, Hibernian, biggest club in Scotland. No, I think not. Currently, Newcastle United won, Manchester United won at half-time. Honestly, I can't wait to get back to normal and we can have some three o'clock kickoffs to talk about. Uh, let's go into the Football League, because we didn't do that. Let's go into the Football League and look at the scores from the Football League today uh, before 9 o'clock. Finish Barnsley 2, Bristol City 2, Birmingham City nil, Sheffield Wednesday 1. Blackburn Rovers nil, Nottingham Forest 1, AFC Bournemouth nil, Queen's Park Rangers nil, Brentford 2, Coventry City nil, Luton Town nil, Stoke City 2, Middlesbrough nil, Reading nil. Rotherham 1, Norwich City 2, Swansea City 1, uh, Huddersfield Town 2, and a family derby here, my sister's hometown versus her husband's team, Wickham Wanderers 1, Millwall 2. League 1 looked like this. Uh, Milton Keynes Dons 2, Gillingham 0, AFC Wimbledon 0, Shrewsbury Town 1, Bristol Rovers 1, Burton Albion 1, Charlton Athletic 1, Wigan Athletic 0, Crew Alexandra 1, Blackpool 1, Fleetwood Town 0, Lincoln City 0, Ipswich Town 2, 
Accrington Stanley nil, Peterborough United two, the worst team in England nil, Oxford United, uh, Plymouth Argyle two, Northampton Town one, uh, Portsmouth nil, Doncaster Rovers one, Rochdale nil, Hull City three, Swindon Town nil, Sunderland two. Sorry, but should, should I say that one louder? Swindon Town nil, Sunderland two. Okay, let's move on. League two, uh, Bolton Wanderers one, uh, Oldham Athletic two. Carlisle United 3, Colchester United 2, uh, so Bolton Wanderers 1, Oldham Athletic 2, uh, Carlisle United 3, Colchester United 2, Crawley Town 4, Morecambe 0, Forest Green Rovers 1, Stevenage 0, Harrogate Town 1, first home game for Harrogate, they've been playing in Doncaster but they've now started playing at their own ground again, Harrogate because they had AstroTurf and they've now got grass, Harrogate Town 1, Barrow 0 of the two teams that came up from the National League last season. Mansfield 1, Bradford City 3, Newport County 1, Tranmere Rovers 0, Port Vale 1, Salford City 0, Scunthorpe United 0, Cambridge United 5. Jeez, that's a thrashing. Walsall 0, Exeter City 0, and Leighton Orient 2, Grimsby Town 3. The National League looked like this. Altrincham versus Bromley, pr pers match postponed. Barnet and Hartlepool United, match postponed. Dagenham and Redbridge, nil. Yeovil Town, nil. Eastley, two. Aldershot Town, two. Notts County, two. Maidenhead United, three. Get in there, my mum's team. She doesn't care about them. I'm trying to get her to be a fan. Solihull Moors, one. Boreham Wood, nil. Torquay United, two. Dover Athletic, nil. Wealdstone, four. Wrexham. Wrexham, go and give it to you. Three. Uh, unfortunately, Ryan Reynolds won't be happy with that one. Weymouth 2, Kings Lynn Town 1, Woking 0, FC Halifax Town 0, and Chesterfield 1, Stockport County 2. I could go on into the National League North and South, but no, that is where we end it. We're going to go for a break. We're going to come back and talk about the big picture and how bad it is. Welcome back to the Football Fan Show, and uh, it's time for the final bit of the show. Uh, we're talking about Project Big Picture, which is a Project Big Deaded, because it's gone, it's done, it's over. It's not going to get through, but we're still going to talk about it anyway, because why not? <sighs> I suppose we have to um, work out first what Project Big Picture was in the first place. So what was it? It was the idea that football league clubs could get a bailout by essentially handing power over to six teams, i.e. Liverpool, Manchester United, Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs, Man City. Why they didn't include Everton in that, I have no idea. So, it was unanimously, it was unanimously rejected. Uh, by Premier League clubs, but so here's what the proposal was uh, Premier League would be cut from 20 to 18 teams with the Championship, League 1 and League 2 retaining 24 teams each. Uh, the bottom two teams from the Premier League relegated automatically with the 16th place team joining the Championship playoffs like German football uh, Parachute payments would be scrapped, a £250 million rescue fund would be made uh, immediately available to the EFL and 25% of all future TV deals. Um, £100 million paid to the Football Association to, Association to make up for the lost revenue and uh, nine clubs given special voting rights based on their long term um, in the Premier League. Um, so the big six would have essentially, of those nine clubs, would have had... Uh, uh, essentially the uh, power to veto anything. Anything. And you know what horrified me about this? Because I, I just thought, okay, the EFL clubs, they're just going to agree to this. Um, because uh, Gary Neville put it very, very, very well, because obviously he's a shareholder in, the, in a football league club, Salford City, that 72 football league clubs agreed and six... It benefited 72 football league clubs and six Premier League clubs. But I don't think it does benefit any EFL club to hand essentially English club football over to six teams 
all with billionaire owners that want to probably stop relegation, probably want to turn it into a more Americanized system. That, And you know what really annoyed me? It was the Stevenage chairman who came out and said, oh, I don't care how the Premier League runs because that's a million miles away. Well, what if your team got lucky? What if Stevenage went on a mammoth run, won the championship, and then Manchester United, Liverpool, uh, Man City, and the other clubs, Spurs, Arsenal, and Chelsea go, yeah, Stevenage is kind of a small market. What if we let Sunderland in? They're in League One, but we don't like Stevenage being in the Premier League, but... We should just elect clubs into the Premier League. Let's scrap relegation. Let's go back to the old election system. Uh, let's elect clubs in the Premier League. And this was my big fear, that that they would just sit around and say, oh, there's a lot of London clubs. Wouldn't you agree, Chelsea, Spurs and Arsenal? Yeah. Shall we kick Fulham and Crystal Palace out of the Premier League without them being relegated? Yeah, sure, why not? Let's bring in, say, I don't know, Let's bring, let's bring in, in Bristol Nottingham City. County. Nottingham. Let's bring in um, Bristol City because Bristol's a big city. They need a team. Ah, uh, Leicester City. You've won the Premier League, but have you won two back-to-back European Cups? I think not. Nottingham Forest taking your spot by democratic decision of six clubs. It annoys. It annoyed me that even the EFL, that the EFL clubs were willing to sell their souls, and it just goes to show, for me, the type of cronyism involved. Because they're all, as far as I'm concerned, they are all crooks now. They've all been made to look like money, 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 money. Give me money, give me money. What about the integrity of the game? If I had been a club owner in the EFL, yes, I would have struggled. I'd rather have died before I'd hand power over to the big six. Because they don't care about the club football. They only care about themselves. And Ian Holloway put it brilliantly when he said, we've got to get the government to step in and stop selfishness in football. He was fantastic. Ian Holloway is a man of the people. Oh, goodness. I go on about club of the people, Leicester City, man of the people. Uh, Ian Holloway. No, but I completely, I completely agree with you, mate. It's, um, you know, in, in times like this, like... In in the past, when there's been a market that's been so unregulated before, the government usually steps in. You know, you see it in the financial markets, you see it in the mortgage markets, you see everything like that. It doesn't, you know, because I th- I think there's that stigma around football saying that the government can't touch it because oh well, it's precious, it's a game, it's a beautiful game, and there's a stigma around it that the government can't step in and touch anything to do with it. But there's a government minister whose responsibility is to keep the game ticking over, keep all sports ticking over. Um, not really doing their job. And, no, no, absolutely not. But that, so what? Then you're when when you're when you start handing over power. It's like um, it's like so. If look at any market, look at any kind of industry or market in the UK, and we can agree that monopolies in any market are illegal what they'd essentially be doing is creating a monopoly in football you know you, any monopoly in this country any company that has more than it more or than 50 percent of the market share is usually state-owned you know people like royal mail um uh tfl things like that you know they are state they are in some way state-owned and therefore, a monopoly is allowed. Istanbul Bashir, that, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, yeah. they shouldn't. Therefore, handing over control like that to the, they hand it over. And the reason why they're called the Big Six is not because of their footballing ability or the culture around them. Is because of the size of their bank account. Yeah. So, and as soon as you, if, again, it's it would be the equivalent of it'd be the equivalent of, let's say, the market regulator saying, okay, scrap all other kind of DPD, Yodel, you know, you guys, you're good minnows, you're good delivery services, but you're done. But now your fate is going to be decided by Amazon. <laughs> I, I know? don't know, DPD, Amazon kind of used DPD, but yeah, no, I get your point. Point well made, but um, my, my either kind that of... Or, or either that or like, 
either that or with like smartphones, you could say, okay, Apple's now going to dictate the fate of LG, Sony, um, Google, and things like that. Yeah, it would be absolutely would stupid. Be. And yeah. yeah, that was my fear that they would just. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing I didn't mention: they'd cap away uh, uh, tickets for uh, away fans to twenty quid. Which, to be fair, there there is some merit in there. I don't want to see the Premier League be reduced to 18 teams. I like the 20-team format of the Premier League. I also like the one club, one vote, which is what was institutionalised when the Premier League was founded. Some EFL chairman... uh, Well, uh, Derby County's chairman spoke on Friday before their game at Watford and said that the Premier League should never have been allowed to break away. Well, you know, that was the top teams knowing... And they had a product that people would watch. They knew that there was either going to be Greg Dyke at ITV that was going to put in all the money or Rupert Murdoch at Sky. One of them was because that's how the Premier League launched because ITV through Greg Dyke and Rupert Murdoch at Sky were out trying to outbid each other. Okay, Alan Sugar may have helped because he was trying to supply satellite dishes to British Sky Broadcasting at the time and may have given a a cheeky phone call to Rupert Murdoch during the negotiations to say, blow ITV out the water, which is very much true. He admits it himself. Um, but the, the obviously television revenue needs to be distributed better. But can I just criticise the EFL for a moment here and say, we know as lower league fans that the EFL does not care about League One or League Two. Their cash cow is a championship. And frankly, they don't care about League One and League Two. And if I were a championship club and I wanted to make more money, I would break away from the EFL. I would create an alliance with the Premier League. Call it the Championship League. Call it the Championship League. 24 clubs, promotion relegation to the Premier League. There you go. EFL can either be reformed with League One, League Two. Heck, merge it with the Football Conference. League One, League Two, League Three. National League One, National League Two. Because all week on Sky Sports News, they've been talking about, oh, you know, we've got 92 professional clubs. No, we don't. We've got over 100 professional football clubs in England. Most of the National League clubs are professional because they're ex-football league clubs. So don't give me that nonsense of 92 professional... What the... What? What? Does it just take a nosedive in quality after they get relegated from League 2? Do they just go... Did Did Wrexham just go, oh, we've been relegated from League 2? Ah, it's best it's time to go semi-professional or amateur. No! They just carried on! Do, do you think Harrogate lot- Town weren't professional before they got promoted to League 2? They were just a bunch of Sunday League players. And then they got promoted to League 2 and they just thought, oh, wow, a Better go professional here. No, they're already professionals. So stop with the horse manure. That there's 92 professional clubs. There are so many more. Hey, there are professional clubs in the National League North and South. Yeah, really, he grinds my gears, you can yeah. tell. No, no, I completely agree with you on that one. Because at the end of the day, the reason why teams go up and down a lot of the time, particularly in the Football League, is due to, you could say, mismanagement of through the owners. You know, if you look at... Best example, look at Blackpool. Ooh, look at the yes. fall, look at the fall from so got into the Premier League and then look at the fall from grace they had because of their owner. Yeah, absolutely. Darlington's another example. If you want that lower Darlington, league going Kid, right Kidderman, down. Kidderminster. Kidderminster, Kidderminster, Kidderminster yeah, as that's well, an, another, one. another one. Kettering Kidderminster, Town. Um, Boston United. Boston United, yeah. Although they they're always a small club. They were quite lucky to be in the Football League. Uh, I I always thought. But yeah, Boston United, Kidderminster, uh, Kettering. I mean, I, I so last night in preparation for this, I went through the National League. Sunderland. Um, yeah, Sunderland. I went through the National League just to have a look at how many professional clubs there were in, in the National League. And barring one or two, pretty much all of them are professional <laughs> so don't tell me that there are 92 professional clubs and then it becomes semi-professional the only reason they call it non-league is because they're not in the football league but they are professional clubs Oldershot Town professional club 
Altrincham, actually a semi-professional club. Barnet, professional club, used to be in the Football League. Boreham Wood, professional club. Bromley, professional club. Chesterfield, Dagenham, Dover, Eastleigh, FC Halifax Town, Hartlepool United. Heck, Hartlepool United, when, when they got relegated from League 2, did they suddenly just go, OK, guys, there's a field over there. We're going to do tryouts for Sunday League. No! They just carried on. Maidenhead United, for God's sakes. Professional club. Notts County, they're still professional. Torquay United, Stockport County, Solihull Moors. We, uh, Wheelstone's actually semi-professional. Uh, Weymouth, Woking, Wrexham, Yeovil. They're all professional clubs. Heck, National League South, Ebsley yes. United got relegated from the National League. Still a professional club. It doesn't go off a cliff. Oh, my yeah, goodness. I don't, I, the problem is, is that as much as it's, it seems like they're quite keen to label teams, semi-professional teams and no longer professional clubs once they drop out of the money-making, uh, well, once they drop out of the money-making leagues. Um, because, you know, then they're, then they're, their role in propping up the football pyramid you know, has been severely reduced. Exactly. Um, and and you, you, again, it can be indirectly linked to the ownership of the club. Yeah. Um, you know, it could. You know, you buy a. Say you take a a team, a random team. They they have their best player. They have a great season. Suddenly, that player attracts interest from other clubs. They get sold. The money goes to the club, and then the owner manages the funds that come through the club from that sale. If they're invested wisely, they thrive. If they don't invest wisely, they fail. And that's where you see people fall, and that's where you see clubs fall down the footballing pyramid. You know, if you look, uh, you know, look at look at Sunderland, for example. You know, they had money. They made very poor investment choices in terms of players, and they're now playing in League One. Bolton as well. You know, Ooh, Bolton yeah. had a severe fall for grace. They were, the Bolton, you know, for a good nearly 10, 15 years were a Premier League mainstay. You know, they, they were, they were, best way to describe them, Bolton were the Burnley of today. They were the Burnley of like the two, early yeah, 2000s. Yeah. They were part of the furniture, yeah. Yeah. They were the team that were neither going to flat, they were neither, they were not going to they wow you with their performances. The, yeah, they weren't going to set the world on but fire, they but they were still going to be there they weren't going to be relegated yeah. um, because they had, you know, because they had enough quality on their team. But as soon as they started selling that quality on or that quality moved on, the money goes into the club and then it's the owner's responsibility to then give the funds to that, to use the funds to buy new players or if the manager left, you know, appoint a new manager, you know? So in, a, in a way, of money, of the... oh yeah, Absolutely. But then again, who's responsible for green lighting the spending of the funds? The you know, owner. an owner the owner the owner owns the club. He owns everything about the club. That means it's like it's rights, it's what happens with the merchandise, who works the food stands, all of it. If the owner doesn't wisely invest the money that they make from either ticket revenue or player sales, then ultimately the club will fall down its its performances will suffer on the pitch. You know, there's no smoke without fire. You know, Absolutely. they don't. Well, they don't one day decide. Oh, actually, we we're crap now, so we're going to start in a relegation battle. You know, I would say majority of it can be linked back to the owners. And I remember re I was reading an article saying that. Um, I'm a, and I'm a big fan of the. I'm a fan of the checks that they have to do for owners. You know, if a new owner comes in to try and take over a club, there has to be a background check on how they've managed their business or how they've made their money before. I mean, I work in I work in finance. I work in a bank, you know. And if someone comes in that you've mm. never heard of and then wants to deposit a ton of money into an account somewhere, you know, naturally the thing to do is ask questions. You know, but, why but I could, would argue like, that the say, EFL and the Premier League don't ask enough questions. I think the fit and proper person's test is just easy to get around. It, it's like, um, it's just easy to get around. But the, the, the something that you bring up that just reminds me of another 
thing that the top six could have done with Project Big Picture is, you know, remember when the Saudis tried to buy Newcastle? Well, that could be yeah. vetoed. They could just say, yeah, you yeah, know what, we don't want yeah. that particular sovereign wealth fund to buy that club, which means rightly or wrongly, the billionaires would look at EFL teams and go, i just buy that because then the Premier League don't have any veto over it. So I could just buy yeah. that club, get them into the into the Premier League. Anyway, what's the alternative now? Because it's been rejected unanimously, so it's now in the past. We don't need to talk about it. Let's just pause, start again. No project big picture. Well, there's a new one called Saving the Beautiful Game. It's being led by some very influential people. Gary Neville. Never heard of him. Um, <laughs> Manchester United legend, Gary Neville and Sky Sports Pundit. Uh, David Bernstein, who is a former chairman of Manchester City, and he w- did become FA chairman for a bit as well. David Davis, the BBC broadcaster. Uh, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester. Uh, Helen Grant, the Conservative MP for Maidstone, who um, helped David Cameron. Denise Lewis, the uh, British, just a amazing British Olympian, Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, and uh, Greg Scott, who uh, was who has been a uh, partner at uh, Memory Crystal Law Firm for 23 years. He's also an Arsenal fan as well. But these people are behind the Saving the Beautiful Game. So let's talk about what their... And it is bullet points here. So they want a... So their first point is they want to be independent of the structure of the game they want an independent body outside of the fa outside of the efl to help govern the game and as gary neville put it the efl uh, sorry the fa don't have the funds to change the game in, a, in any way that that could allow it to continue and survive down further down the period pyramid um Decide on new ways of distributing funds to the wider game based on funding formulas and a fair levy uh, payable to the English Premier League. Uh, Set up a new and comprehensive licensing system for the professional football clubs. This is based on the German licensing system where it is reviewed and renewed every year. And could, by the way, um, going back to a conversation that we had a couple of episodes ago, could see if a club folds it could see somebody else buy that license and reform the club in that league. So, a Macclesfield Town went out of business in the National League this season, but somebody's bought the assets of the club and started Macclesfield FC. So they could have bought the Macclesfield license in the National League and just inserted Macclesfield FC into the National League. Unfortunately, that's not the way we do it, and he's had to apply, and it's probably going to get rejected. Uh, but Macclesfield FC, by the way, welcome to the well, club. that works. That, that would work in a sense because essentially what you're doing is then you're because then that governing body would then make money through those licensing fees exactly you're essentially saying you're essentially saying if you want to be a club and you want to play in this league you have to purchase a license to play in this league and that and I think that would work for me but um, yeah it, it, the, that's the, what they the, do in the, Germany yeah and the th- and the thing is there I mean, very rarely do you hear about any German clubs, you know, struggling financially or going out of business. 1860 um, Munich. Yeah. 1860 <laughs> that's, Munich. Yeah, that, that's, pro- that's probably down to the way you've been running them on Football Manager, but I'll say mm, nothing on that. Not um, really. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a whole story. But yeah, they, 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 fell, they fell foul of the licensing laws in Germany and got relegated to the fifth division. Back in the third division now, but um, yeah, go on. That is the only club in Germany. It's kind of farcical, but that's a whole different story and a whole different sidewalk to go down, which we're not doing. That's, it's again, again, it's it's another comparison between the governing bodies in this industry and the governing bodies in the other industry. The this is the problem faced by football clubs when the governing body for the game across the UK is run like a business yeah. because it's it's a governing body that has shareholders, it has directors, so it has people left, right and centre who are wanting a return on something. However, when you look at other industries and how they operate in the UK, again, I can use the financial system as an example. Two major governing bodies in the UK financial system are the Financial Conduct Authority 
and the Prudential Regulation Authority. They are independent governed bodies. They are not for profit. They are managed by a board of select of of trustees, if you like. They are not run as a business to turn a profit. They are people. They are an organisation whose responsibility is to manage the market and make it manage the financial market and make it fair for the customers. What you have with the EFL, the FA, and the Premier League is that you have a lot of governing bodies who are operated as businesses, as private limited companies with the aim to make a profit, and that's why their view will always be skewed. The prudential, the FCA's only job in the financial market is to make sure it's fair. As long as it does that job done. The problem with running it as a business is that not only have you got to make it fair for every team involved, you've got to make sure everyone has a fair point, you have a governance system, but ultimately you're going to have a backing of shareholders who want their return. They want their dividend. And that's going to be the problem because you're trying to appease too many people, which you're not ultimately going to do. Yeah, that's the issue nowadays. And somebody brought it up on Sky Sports this week that buying, we all know, I think it was Carragher, Kara actually, who said, we all know that that the, the the cat's out of the bag. Football investment is no longer a passion project. It can now make you money. So we have seen mm-hmm. hedge funds, uh, complete sharks by football clubs just in the a small attempt to make a buck. Maybe the Glazers. Um, if you're a Manchester United fan, because they're definitely there to make... Uh, well, they're they're there to make their banks money because uh, they have massive uh, debts that Manchester United are paying off. Did you know, for example, Manchester United are not uh, are not allowed to make a profit lower than sixty million pounds a year. If they make a, a loss of, uh, if they make less than sixty million pound profit a year, then the banks can call out call up their um, loans and demand repayment immediately. Not happened, but probably never going to happen but it, they do make the banks money um the final three points of this save fo- saving the beautiful game implement governance reforms for the fa which are essential to ensure it is run truly independently diverse and representative of english football today a fundamental reform of the fa council would be an impressive start to this proceeding Liaise with supporter organisations to progress the issues that are of concern to uh, fans and provide a greater voice for supporters. And finally, study lessons learned from abroad to seek uh, and seek to uh, champion supporter involvement in the running of clubs. Now, this final one. You know, we talk about Germany being a supporter's paradise, whereas there is a 50 plus one rule. But actually... German fans don't see it that way. There's an interesting uh, documentary. If you follow a half time on DW, which is a German broadcasting station on YouTube, they've just done um, an English language um, episode where they look at the 50 plus one rule and how it has benefited Bayern Munich and how it has made German football considerably boring because it's just Bayern. Or it's Dortmund in second, Schalke here, um, and ignoring the fact that actually quite a lot of the f- football clubs are, are in a lot of debt in Germany, um, but they are now trying to look for ways to not end the fifty plus one rule, but stop Bayern Munich's dominance. And kind of the way the German system is built benefits Bayern Munich, which isn't very good as far as I'm concerned, or anybody else that wants to see Dortmund or. Um, or um, that wants to see a Dortmund or a Union Berlin or a Hertha Berlin or a Hamburg or a anybody just challenge the Bayer Leverkusen. And actually the Southampton manager, um, Ralph Hasselhuten, put, put it very well when he said, you know, m- the Premier League is the best league because you have six, seven teams that compete. <laughs> So why would you want to change that? Why would you want to ruin that? You know, And he used Germany as an example, saying you would never get a Leicester City winning the Bundesliga against Bayern. Never in a million years. You would never get, say, a Hertha Berlin beating Bayern Munich for the league title. You would never have that. Have that in England. Cherish it. Enjoy it because it's fantastic and it's why people watch the game in, in the country. You don't get that in Spain, you don't get it in France, you don't get it in Italy. 
we're the only country where you where that is a realistic possibility and yeah it might not happen for another 20 or 30 years still a possibility you know there's a there's a possibility that Newcastle United could win the Premier League next year a very unlikely possibility yeah but a possibility nonetheless and that's why I love the Premier League is it's open I don't know about the saving the beautiful game thing I I'm not I like some of it but I'm not sure I think the I, th I think they're po they're pointing the finger of blame at the FA I would point the finger of blame at the EFL I think the EFL is not fit for purpose I think the FA is a bit pants but um and there's a saying we've got in England called Sweet Football Association, which means F all. Um, there's a reason why it's Sweet FA. Um, but yeah, do you, who do you blame in this scenario? Is it the EFL or the, or the FA? Because I'm firmly against the EFL here. I, I think they're, they're, they're unfit for the custodians of the league game. I would say I, w I would agree with you 100% on the fact that the EFL doesn't seem to serve its purpose in enhancing and bettering the sport of football. Um, I think I th think that the problem is there. You've got too many governing bodies trying to. You've got too many gov governing bodies trying to basically all fight for a share of a very volatile part. Um, you've got and it, and there's and it's. Too many, too many governing voices. Not enough voices from the teams it actually affects. Not enough voices from the fans of who they, how they'd like to see it run. Um, it's a lot of. I mean, to, to be fair, the save the beautiful game thing. A lot of it, especially the last couple of points, definitely sat from Gary Neville. Definitely sounds like he's trying to do a bit to protect his. Inv the reason why he's caring so much about the EFL is because he doesn't want it to stop. He probably wants to protect his, his investment in Salford City because there's no doubt he's probably put a chunk of change into that club. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So that's why. So that's so that's what it sounds a bit like. Is like I've invested my time it's and my money in Salford City. I want to see it do well. Yeah. yeah. And I think also argue that when he wants you... a bit more money for non-league as well, which is where Salford City came from. Yeah, I mean, I think seeing non-league teams come up, that's good because, you know, everyone gets tired of the same monopoly of the same teams um, vying for places, fighting for titles and things like that. Um, if it's, it's a tough one because it's, you know, you you got to think to yourself, are we just putting in, what, are we just replacing one corrupt system with another? Because no system's going to inest appease everybody because at the end of the day all clubs all owners all chairmen are going to be inwardly inward focused they're going to be inwardly facing they're just going to focus on the future of their clubs and their and by extension their wallets as well um so i i would say my my preference would be to have one ultimate governing body of football not the fa the efl and the premier league i say one governing body that covers everything from the Premier League down. So like they did in Scotland where the Premier League and the Scottish Football League merged into the Scottish Professional Football League and they had one one four-tier uh, system, but then you've got the Scottish FA as a, as a separate thing, so I know what you're calling for the FA, all of it to be under one umbrella like it is kind of in Spain and uh, Germany. Yeah, in a way, because ultimately, Ultimately, when you have too many governing bodies, especially governing bodies that are run as businesses, you know they're private, they're privately or publicly owned. Because when you have public and private ownership, you have there's always going to be people that are driven by monetary gain. Where whether it's a whereas if you have it run like a a CIC, uh, a community interest company. Where it's managed, it's incorporated but managed by a board of trustees. It's limited by guarantee, if you like. Mm. Then that's when that's when it starts to be managed for, and the performance is, and the performance of it is measured by the effectiveness and the impact it's had on the game, and not by 
figures on a figures on a spreadsheet. Um, so I think having one ultimate footballing body that applies the rules to equally because equality in a situation where clubs who clubs who have half a million in the bank versus clubs who have half a million in the bank quality is not what it's all about it's about equity um so you when when you start handing power over to your man cities and things like that when you hand the power over to the big six they will want, they'll want to fiercely guard their places as the big six you know so therefore they'll veto anything that threatens that so like you said the example would be the saudi takeover of new Newcastle, you know that could threaten their position in that big six bit. Um, again, it's like it's a, it's a tough one to discuss, really, because again, it's like discussing, you know, it's <laughs> it's like it's like saying what my and it's like how do I destroy my house? Shall I burn it? Shall I uh, bur- shall I burn it down or? <laughs> if I burn it down or use this crane to knock it down, ultimately, ultimately the results are the same. You know, yeah. your house is destroyed, but the methods are different. And it's the same with the football. Who, you know, are you going to be just replacing one corrupted system with another? Are you going to be replacing a system that benefits a group of clubs with a system that benefits another group of clubs? You know? Yeah, I know what I, I know what you're where you where you're going with it. Um, you know, I think you know. Obviously, Project Big Picture is a non-starter because we all like the English football pyramid. This kind of idea of this ranks to riches story. Uh, yeah. I just I, I hate the constant talk of the ninety-two professional clubs because there aren't ninety-two. There are more than ninety-two. I hate the mm. the idea that that that, that during these finan- these unprecedented financial time these money grabbing so and sos just want more money and more power. I mean, the fact mm. that this was two American owned clubs, Liverpool and Manchester United. That let's face it, the Glazers are there for the money because Manchester United makes some money. Okay, Fenway Sports might be a little bit different because they do actually seem to care about the clubs they own but still it's clearly a ploy for money and to cement Absolutely. Liverpool's position as a as a top club by the way Liverpool and Manchester United voted against their own proposal uh, one thing I do want to say actually because I didn't criticise the FA is that they knew about this for months and the only reason they commented is because it got leaked in the Daily Mail and if, or the Telegraph, sorry. Um, and if it hadn't have been leaked, then they would have just brushed it under the carpet, because that's what the FA mm. do. Because they're a shady, they're a shady organisation, and that they clearly are run by incompetent tools that don't seem to care about the club, uh, club game. I do want to, or anything like that. I do. I do want to ask your. I do want to. I do want to ask your opinion on something, and it is loosely linked to what we were discussing. But at the same time, it's a bit different. Hmm. What do you think of the? What do you think of the salary cap that's been implemented on some of the lower leagues? I love it in the English football league. I love it. Yeah, I think it's it's been a long time coming. But what the thing is, the thing is that I've become acutely aware of is that the salary cap in League One and League Two, there is no salary cap in the National League. So you could be spending tons of money in the National mm. League to get into the EFL, and then suddenly you're in League Two, salary cap. So uh, the, you, the, 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 then we have to go yeah. back to this talk of the different governing bodies, because you've got the, the, the Football Association, the Premier League, the EFL, the Football Conference. They all need to get on the same page. The Football Conference should have a salary cap in line with the EFL. So... That's why they all need to merge, in my opinion. Why the EFL and the Football Conference especially need to merge, and the Championship needs to merge with the Premier League and go its own way. Um, that's my preferred. Absolutely. Preferred. My preferred structure of the football of English football is the Championship breaks away from the EFL because the EFL doesn't give a crap about League One, and League Two. Uh, force it to give a crap about League One, and League Two by taking away its cash cow of the Championship because there ain't no one paying to watch. Um, 
unfortunately, Oxford United versus Peterborough United. No one ain't paying jack for that. Uh, no one cares about that. It's why I Sky think, Sports never show yeah, any of the absolutely. matches from League One and League Two. They only ever show, um, they only ever show championship matches. Even BT Sport broadcasts the bloody National League. Come on, I'd like to watch some League Two, League One matches. Um, but I think I think League One and League Two should sell their TV rights separately from the Championship. I think the Championship should just break away from the EFL. The EFL should concentrate on League One and League Two, and maybe even the National League if it merges with the footballing conference because they're all professional clubs anyway um and the championship should go its own way and become a premier league two and then you can have a two-tiered top league premier league 20 clubs champion championship league whatever you want to call it uh or premier league two as the second league uh full of professional clubs and you share the same revenue stream um, so if Sky and BT buy the rights to the premier league then they also get as a package deal the rights to the championship as well as do Amazon Prime, or as we were going, as we were talking about earlier, you could set up a Premier League streaming service for nine ninety nine. You can have both leagues on there. Well, maybe fourteen ninety nine for both leagues. That's fair, um, and then you can watch both leagues. But I think the Championship should should break away from the EFL, merge with the Premier League, and become a Premier League two. I think the EFL should merge with the Football Conference and make and turn League One, League Two, and the National League into National League One, National League Two, National League Three, and then amateur, semi-professional after that, and enforce semi-professional football with a wage cap. So there needs to be a wage cap. So there is a wage cap currently in League One and League Two. Does it go far enough? I don't know what the limit is. Um, honestly, I haven't really looked at it that much. I, I think, should look at it I think, more. I think the limit. I think the limit is that clubs can only spend, um, especially in League One, because I remember Richie Wellens um, discussing it, saying that they that clubs can only spend 50% of what they bring in. Uh, so it helps it helps cap teams like Sunderland, you know, who you could argue Ooh. are a bit big to be playing in League One. Manchester United have just scored. Ah. Sorry, Bruno Fernandes, 86th ah. minute, 2-1. Was it a penalty? Uh, no. Set oh, up by Marcus Rashford, MBE. Uh, of course. The only um, Manchester sorry, United player will probably get a round of applause at Anfield. <laughs> uh, get a round of applause anywhere. Um, yeah, sorry. 2-1 uh, Manchester yeah. United. Yeah, sorry. So, I, I interrupted your train of thought with that. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so, I think the salary cap needs to go a bit further down because then you don't have your teams like, perfect example, Billa Ricky Town. <laughs> yep. They spent insane you don't amounts have of money. Team, you don't have teams like that paying it, paying insane amounts of money. Basically, paying too much money for the league they're in. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have them buying ex Premier League stars money, at, at the end dependent. of the. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the sa- and the the problem is, is I I also would agree that the salary cap doesn't go high enough. You could argue that saying that something like that could be in the Premier League as well, as an argument for it. Because then... I wouldn't agree with you. I, I I wouldn't agree with you with the Premier League. I, I would say the Championship because there's a massive income disparity between uh, Championship and League One clubs. So mm. maybe there does need to be a salary cap for uh, the Championship because it's currently only League One and League Two. But as I say, you know they won't. In, the, the EFL won't put a salary cap on the Championship because that's their cash cow. It's the only league that makes the money. It's the sixth best league in Europe. It's a, it's the best second tier league in the world. Mm. So the championship could make money on on its own back if it broke away from the EFL, which is what, I, what personally I think, you know, as I've, as I've said, I, I think that's personally what it needs to do. But we talk about the salary cap. The National League needs a salary cap. I mean, like, Billericay Town were a professional club in non-league. They are in the they are in the yeah. National League South, and yet they are a professional club. Yes, they had an owner that was willing to accept the club would lose money, and he would throw money at it. Absolutely. Currently managed by Jamie O'Hara, by the way, <laughs> one of the old Premier League players, <laughs> and uh, not doing well in the National League South. Uh, and I, I'm struggling to remember the guy's name. Was it Greg, Greg Tamplin or something? Glenn, the, and Glenn Tamplin. Uh, yeah, Glenn, Glenn Tamplin. Yeah, Glenn Tamplin. Um, who is currently the owner and manager of Romford Football Club. Romford Football Club, who play in the Ismian League North. They, by the way, are not a professional club. Not yet, anyway. 
But yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I think there needs to be... I think there's always been a history of reckless ownership as well. And obviously football is, is littered with self, self-interest. self But, you know, this, the, the way the EFL was willing to... The, the EFL clubs were willing to sell their souls to the big six was, was quite frankly, horrifying. Um, and now they've rejected a £50 million bailout because the Premier League, after rejecting the Project Big Picture, offered a, a bailout to League One and League Two clubs. And now the EFL have turned around and said, no, we don't want that one because it doesn't include the championship. The championship has a bunch of billionaires in it. You know? Pre- mm. <laughs> the, the, the Premier League are quite right to say, oh, Bristol City are owned by a very wealthy man. Uh, uh, Preston North End owned by a very wealthy man. Um... <laughs> You know there are some very wealthy clubs in in the um, in the championship. Watford aren't entirely the the poorest club in the world. Neither are QPR. They're all owned by very successful business people in other in other areas of business, and they're all pretty much owned by billionaires because that's what you need to do to to be apart from Wickham. Um, you know you need to be a billionaire to really survive in the championship nowadays so actually yeah. I understand why the Premier League would not want to give money to the championship clubs because they're all owned by very wealthy individuals League 1 and League 2 clubs that's not the case uh, apart from Salford City in which case don't give them any f- sort of financial package whatsoever and let them be relegated uh, <laughs> uh, no I'm joking um, but I just it's it's confusing I'm confused my head hurts and I, I, how do we save English football? How do we... We need to save it from itself first, don't we? Yeah. Before you bring... You know, before you throw it in... They always say the first step in a, in um, in a helping a problem is realising there is one. Um, but there, there seems to be... There seems to be a lot of... A lot of loud voices all trying to have their say in what they think that problem is. You know, whether if it's the club at the tops of too much money or if it's the clubs that fall down the ladder still have too much money, if um, lower league clubs are paying too much money, if, you know, clubs are running themselves into the ground with not enough money and therefore not, you know, why is he managing it? It seems to me that there's a lot of, we haven't even got to the step of realising what the problem is. It seems like a lot of people are trying to find their, they find their own reason for there being a problem in football. Um, so I think once we identify that then we can actually start working on some they can start working on some concrete plans in what in what to do to actually save football not only from a financial aspect but from a let's say a spiritual aspect as well you know so it's uh, so it's, it's the age old question is like you know the money in football is destroying the game in terms of the beautiful game, in terms of the spiritual aspect, but in terms of financial and the business aspect, it's saving the game. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough question. It's a really, really tough question to say, how do we save English football? I think just, I think an independent governing body, which is managed by a board of trustees and not by a group of shareholders and directors would be a start. Because then you have people whose only motivation it for the decisions they make would be the betterment of the game and the fairness of the game, as opposed to a private limited company as acting as a governing body whose actions and decisions are going to be mainly influenced by how they can fill their pockets up. Yeah, uh, I, I I agree, but. This is football, and it won't happen. Uh, <laughs> why do we waste our time can, with these pointless discussions? It's never going to happen. Why do we waste our time for I'll your tell you, entertainment? I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what would be really good for you. If you really want to see what the ownership of a football club is like. So when I was doing GC, um, me and when we, me and you both, did me and you both do GCSE business in St. Joseph's? Yeah. 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 Did you ever do you remember the playing the game the hot seat? Not really. I can't really remember that one. Uh, so there's an there's there's an online interactive game called the hot seat 
where you're the owner of a football club and you've um and you've got to get that club um and you you've got to get that club um promoted so it's over season so it's like it's like a football that thing's like a 30 day yeah so it's like it's like football manager except you're the chairman, you're the chairman so yeah. you get yeah so you get the ones of like you get the questions of like this um oh this amazing young brazilian player who has such high potential um has been scouted and you can make this deal happen however in return for the club wanting you to buy their star player they want you to loan out two two of your solid reliable players who may be a bit older However, this Brazilian kid may not reach his Whoa. full potential. How do you make this decision? Sorry, three one uh, Manchester. United. So I would. Who scored? One Basaka, ninetieth minute. Uh, on uh, Sky Sports box office, uh, box office stuff. Sorry, I'll stop making those jokes as soon as they take my pay per view. Is, is Alan Saint Maximan playing? Uh, I will have a look at the uh, Newcastle United team, but I'm not sure. He did, by the way, best bit of transfer news for Newcastle fans, sign a five-year contract this week. He signed a brand-new contract, and he <laughs> he celebrated by sharing that um, uh, meme from um, The Wolf of Wall Street where, where he's on the microphone. And he goes, I ain't leaving. And then everyone starts <laughs> cheering. So he's shared that and he's signed a new five year deal. I'll tell you, um, I try uh, to find I'll tell you what, 16, 16 million pounds from Nice sounds like, like an absolute steal for him at the moment. I think so. I think so indeed. And that match is coming. Oh my goodness, no. It's not four. It just said four. It just said four. It is. It does say four, but who scored? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know, Jeff. I don't know. I don't know who scored. Oh, oh no, it's Rashford What's on that? the 96th minute. Marcus <laughs> Rashford, MBE, 96th minute goal. That's what's happened, Jeff. Don't know who I'm calling Jeff here. I, <laughs> I, I genuinely want him to put the letters MBE on the back of his shirt now. I, I want him to do, I just want, I don't want him to have Rashford on his shirt, just MBE and MBE. Because yeah. <laughs> let's face it, no one else on, on a pitch is going to have an MBE. So let's, you know, they will unless, get MBEs Beckham, after they retire. Unless Beckham comes out of retirement, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's what I want. I, I want either, can we start the petition to get Marcus Rashford to get knighted? Because I want Sir Marcus Rashford on the pitch. <laughs> Not that yeah. I want him playing for Manchester United or anything. I just find it hilarious that yeah. he'll just put Sir you on can his... imagine. You can imagine <laughs> the Martin Tyler one. He's like, Balot Balotelli, Sir Marcus! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's full time. It's 4-1. 4-1, full time. 96th minute goal for Marcus Rashford. 4-1. Newcastle United 1. Manchester United 4. Box office stuff. Oh, God. God, I've got to stop making those jokes. And that is it for our program. Um, reshaping the EFL, never going to happen. Bye-bye, Project Restart. Bye-bye to this show. We'll be back next week from 7pm. See ya. Have a good week. Bye. <laughs>